and we ran out of time. I'm a very bad clock keeper, and I was counting on Robert to play the chords like he did the first week, but um, that meant that I overstepped, and the choir came in a little bit late. So uh, we did finish up this, the scene, but we didn't really answer the question about forgiveness. So we're going to spend a couple of minutes this morning talking about the, the concept of forgiveness in Islam. And I have my timer set today so that I can't possibly go over if anyone sees my temptation to go over, I need you to wave your hands and say, okay, it's, it's done. It's time for the choir to come in. So I'm asking for your help. Um, Tarek, uh, let me read a couple of things to, to, you, to you, and then maybe, Hashmat, you can um, share with us the, the importance of forgiveness in Islam. I will try. You will try. I'm sure you, you will do great. So we've, we've looked at the Quran. Uh, in, in the first session, and we've referred to it a number of times. Tariq uh, recommends three um, items. I, I will read from two of them. One of them is from the Surah Sumar, uh, number 53. Think of it as like the chapter in the book of. Good morning. Are you Hannah? Good morning. You got here so fast. If you have a thumb drive, come, come. If you have a thumb drive, we'll stick it in, and I will help you. Okay, terrific. So um, I was starting with a little um, uh, presentation from Tariq from last time about forgiveness. Thank you. Okay. So um, Surah Zumar 53, think of it as like the book and the chapter of, as we would look at the Bible. It says... O oh, my servants who have transgressed against themselves by sinning, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. Indeed, it is he who is the forgiving, the merciful. There is a hadith that he recommends to us as well, which says, O oh, son of Adam, so long as you call upon God and ask of God, he shall forgive what you have done, and he shall not mind. O son of Adam, were your sins to reach the clouds of the sky, and were you then to ask forgiveness, God would forgive you. O son of Adam, were you to come to God with sins nearly as great as the earth, and were you then to face God, ascribing no partner to God, he would bring forgiveness nearly as great as it is. So forgiveness is a very big deal, and that was a great question. Um, did you ask the question? Yes. So I wanted to make sure we honored your question and got back to you. And with that, um, Hashmat had something to say about forgiveness, and then we will introduce you to Hana. Good morning. My name is Hashmat Ali. I'm from Acclaim Islamic Center, and... Uh, Bill Larson uh, is uh, my dear best friend actually at Tyson's Interfaith and we work together and I owe a lot to him. He taught me and uh, I learned a lot about the interfaith things from him. So I thank you and I thanks all, everybody to give me a chance being here. Uh, coming back to what uh, just uh, Paula read from Quran, that surah gives me the most relief and gives me the most satisfaction also when I think about that, the God is so merciful. We are prone to mistakes, we are prone to sin, and we t try to do our best, but when I think about that surah, uh, from Quran, and, and she mentioned that the, you know, you know in, in uh, Bible also the same kind of thing. So um, one of the thing which is stuck in my mind is the God says, um, "I will forgive you, no matter how many times you, you know, go away from me and come back to me. I'll keep forgiving you." But one thing which really, you know, give me a lot of satisfaction is that He says that when you are dying. If at that time you remember me and ask for forgiveness, 
at that moment, and I, most of the time we know when we are dying, unless it's something happened, accidents and all that thing, but you know, when you are sick, you know, you know, we are, it's, it's over now. But if at that time you remember and ask forgiveness from God, that God, please forgive my, my sin, he will forgive you, there is no question about that. After that, you don't have a chance to make any mistake or, or, or sin. So you go to pearly gate right away. That is it, because God said that, that if at that moment before you are dying, you ask for forgiveness, I will forgive you. That means there are no more sin, there is no more, no more time for you to sin. So, you know, it's almost sure that, you know, we will be there all, hopefully we all together will be there in, in, in heaven. So that's, that's, that's my belief and I really truly believe in it. And hopefully I will get a chance, hopefully everybody else will get a chance at that time when we die, we ask for forgiveness and we go like an innocent baby back to, back to him. Thank you. Thank you. This is, uh, this is... Uh, I, I know, I know. Okay. Um, Brother Hashimoto was very uh, kind, and he asked me earlier if I could send a bio of myself so that uh, he could introduce me. And in the midst of trying to juggle a million and a half other things, I apologize, I didn't do that. So I'll take it on myself to go ahead and introduce myself. But my name is uh, Hannah Yunus. I am the chaplain and Muslim community coordinator at uh, the Shenandoah University in Winchester, Virginia. I used to serve at the Adams Center uh, not far from here. A masjid that is, is affiliated with. I was working in education. Um, but my training has been in chaplaincy and specifically with the focus on interfaith dialogue. Um, for me personally, obviously living in a very diverse area, it's very important to be able to navigate the differences that we have. And so that's what I chose to focus on through my masters and what I hope um, I can offer a little bit here through this discussion. But uh, I actually wanted to start with a story, um, and if I can just get the first slide up to get my mind uh, going, but I wanted to start with the story of an example of interfaith in a way that we don't traditionally think of interfaith dialogue. Um, but as I was doing a lot of work with interfaith, I was regularly attending church on Sundays, I was regularly attending Torah studies, um, I was doing a lot to be able to um, educate myself on the differences that we have amongst each other. And in the midst of all of that, I decided I really needed to do something to relax. And so I started volunteering. And where I went, there was probably, um, most of the people there had never met a Muslim in their life. Um, because I was, I was kind of going out into the country, um, about an hour west of here, to, to do that work. And so, most of them had not met a Muslim before. And the first year, uh, we did not talk about religion at all. We just, we just connected on what brought me there. Um, full disclosure, it was, a, it was an animal rescue facility. I love animals. And so we really were just connecting on that work, on the fact that we had a passion for animals and for respect for the life of the animals as much as the respect for the life of human beings. Um, and so, when Ramadan came around that year, it was in the summer. I was volunteering from 8 a.m. to about 10, 11 a.m., usually three days a week. And Ramadan at this point is about a 16-hour day. So I can't get dehydrated by 10 a.m. because I don't get to break my fast until 8.30 p.m. I don't get to use all my calories by that time because I'm not going to get to replenish until 8.30 at night. So finally, religion had to come up. And I said to, uh, to the group as they were standing there, I said, listen, Ramadan is starting soon, which means I'm going to be fasting, and I'm not sure how that's going to impact my work here. Now, I had brought up religion to people who had never met a Muslim before. They scattered. Everybody went their different ways, getting to their work. Okay, okay, and they just went. And that was the end of that discussion. So, okay, I, I guess we'll figure it out as we get closer to it. So year two comes around, and I've been working with them two, three days a week, uh, every week. And by year two, um, I had said, Ramadan's coming around again. And this time they said, no problem. We've got work in the office for you. I said, okay. <laughs> so they spent that Ramadan helping out in the office. They went in to make sure I was in the air conditioning. Year three comes around, and that's 
um, I had become so involved in this and had such a passion for it, I actually wrote a book for them that they could sell for a fundraiser. So their response was that they wanted, now I had never been put in any of the pictures of the volunteers and I didn't, I didn't mind because I understood that there was a concern potentially about putting my face out in a community where they may not be open to Muslims at all. And what would that do to their donation? So I didn't push anything like that ever. Now all of a sudden I had published this for them and now they were making sure that this was something I got credit for. And so as people were coming in and we did a signing and all of this stuff, um, they had assigned me to the barn so that I would stay cool in the shade. And someone brings me a book and she said, can you sign it for me? I just bought it. I said, sure, I can take it out to the table and sign it for you. She said, no, 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 they said you need to stay in the barn <laughs> because they were trying to make sure that I stayed cool and that I didn't get dehydrated. Um, and so slowly there was this, this breaking down of what we couldn't even talk about. And they were learning to respect that. They were learning to embrace it and to accommodate it. And still, we hadn't even had a conversation. Other than that, I have to fast and that's it. So then year four comes around. And uh, it was Ramadan again. And we had our volunteer appreciation. And I told them, I won't be joining this year because I'll be fasting. And so the head of the organization, she came to me and she asked, is there anything that we can do just out of respect for the fact that you're fasting while we're eating? And I said, no, don't worry about it. I actually have to go out anyway. And I had to go out for the Friday prayer. But again, we weren't quite at that point of discussing that. And I said, don't worry about it. But thank you so much. I appreciate it. But that's the type of, of change that happens when you just get to a place where you can connect on a human level and you start to learn about people's differences and start to respect them. So when I came back, I took a break for the Friday prayer and I came back. And when I came back, she had packed leftovers for me to take home so I could break my fast with that, right? Um, and so it's such a transformation. But this is for me, in all of my work and training in interfaith, has been the most profound um, experience that I've had in terms of making that shift of just, you know what, now we're all close friends. And one of my friends actually from there, um, we were talking about going hiking. And I said, listen, we haven't talked about religion a lot, I know, but because the hike is so long, I'm going to have to stop to pray. She said, and this was after I had moved to Winchester, which is a whole different story. But uh, she said to me, no problem. I've got my bear spray, and I'll fight off anybody who tries to bother you while you're praying. And and so that's what it becomes. And the reason that I like to share that story when people are discussing interfaith dialogue is because sometimes we get so focused on starting with what we have that's different that we forget what we have in common. Um, and so I just wanted to bring that to, to your attention as we start. Do you have, okay. Is that, that's the second one, okay. Perfect, thank you. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't even remember. Um, so getting to know one another. The Quran says, we have made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. another so that you may know one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that the very reason that you and I are not the same is for the purpose of me learning about you and learning about you and you learning about me. And what do our cultures say and what do our traditions say? And to understand and respect those differences. He didn't say that that was so that we could divide and split into different areas and live in our own separate bubbles. And so as a Muslim, this is my engagement with anyone else is a response to God's command that we are here to know one another. Whether it's through dialogue in a church or dialogue on a farm, or you know, not so much religious dialogue, but just interpersonal dialogue. So my question for the group would be, who here has somebody that you love more than anybody else in the world? Your spouse, your parent, your child? Raise your hand if there is somebody who you absolutely love. I would ask that you only put your hand down, keep it up, only put your hand down if there is nothing that you disagree with that person on, right? Even, you can put it down now, <laughs> even the most beloved person to you is different, right? There's going to be some things that you disagree on. 
But what is it that brought you together? It's the similarities, and likely you focused on those similarities when you were getting to know that person. And so this type of dialogue, interreligious dialogue, is the same thing. Do we have the courage to look beyond what our differences are and say, I just, let's just get to know each other where we can meet. Now, I need to work more on studying the Bible and understanding it better, but I'm going to bet that the Bible has something in it that is similar to what we have here in the Quran, that the purpose of our differences or the fact that we are here and that we are different means that we should still be getting along in some way, right? And it's not going to be the only verse. There's plenty of verses like that. So why not start the conversation from there and keeping that in mind in any interaction that you have with somebody of a different tradition? Okay, yes, I might believe this about God or that or this about the afterlife or that, but let's just start where we, where we have in common. And as communities, the way that we can do that is to even when we are working with the larger community, if it's an issue of homelessness, if it's an issue of hunger, and we address those together, those are all things we have in common, right? Those are all shared teachings within our scriptures. So we can, we can take that time and take that uh, as an opportunity to come together. Just yesterday, I was at um, a suicide prevention walk. I didn't know anybody else there. It's in Stevenson, Virginia. Um, but immediately when you're there, whether it's that somebody has had a struggle with suicide, whether it's somebody has lost a person because of suicide, um, or they, you know, wh whatever, they know a friend who, who has a friend, whatever it was, there was immediately this connection and this need to support each other because, again, there was something in common. And so if we can bring our congregations to work together on issues that we share and issues that our traditions tell us we are supposed to be following, then you might be coming from a different faith and you're following your scripture, but we're doing the same thing as me and my tradition, I'm following my scripture. And so that's one way that we can bring our communities together. I know the Adam Center does that a lot, um, and I'm sure MIC does, does the same, but to engage in service projects, and this is particularly important with the next generation, with the youth, and it's a wonderful way that they can do that. Um, so dialogue and trust, what comes first? Just as I was using the example of, of friends getting to know each other, there is the option of, okay, yes, doing it this way. Do we have dialogue and talk about our differences, or um, do we get to know each other? And it's kind of sometimes we get caught in that chicken and the egg uh, scenario. So, Paula, is it actually okay if I stand up here so I can just put my papers down? Apologize. My, my, my brain was only working on its own for so long, so now I will jump back to my notes. Uh, it's been, I apologize, it's been quite a interesting month. So, I have had to do pre two presentations where everyone's like, okay, where's your PowerPoint? And I'm like, no, it's, it's old school this week. I apologize, we're paper and pen. Um, okay. Oh, right. I'm walking around with both. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, so yeah, so we talked about the verse that God says in the Quran that, um, let me get my brain together here, that uh, we need to get to know one another. And I think one of the challenges that we have in, in this dialogue is people feel threatened by the other, right? They feel threatened that, is somebody going to try to make me become Muslim? Am I accidentally going to say something that, be, that I became Muslim while I was you know, chanting or repeating after others? So part of the, the, the treaty that you kind of have to come together when you are doing interfaith dialogue is an understanding with the other, and if that's something that as a community you need to have documented, um, that there won't be any attempts to convert, and I, I, that, I know that might sound extreme, but it can happen on any, uh, on any side, making sure that there is a clear understanding between all the parties involved, that the objective is not to try to change a person's faith, because in order to have dialogue, you have to feel safe. 
You have to feel like you can be who you are, where you are. And that's something that uh, holds people back a lot. It's like, oh, I don't know. What's going to happen if I go to the masjid? What's going to happen if I listen to the adhan? Like, did something happen I didn't know about? Oftentimes, when I would go to the synagogue, I had no idea what was being said. So I would stand when the others would stand, but I would stand si silently. If there was something that I knew to be OK, I might repeat after them. But uh, similarly with my work now, my boss is United Methodist. And as he was reviewing his prayers and different talks that he might give, he would have me review them for him as well and say, you know, what do you think of this? And I could be honest with him, and I would you know, say, Reverend, I think you'll have Muslims basically from here to here to here, and then as soon as you say children of God, they're all going to have a little bit of an internal spiritual allergy, and you just, you have to decide if that's something that you want to keep, or if at the end, you know, if you do want to choose to change that, and, and the rest of the community might feel a little bit more comfortable with a shared amen uh, at the end of that. And so he, he chose to, to go ahead and remove it. He felt that the content and the prayer was sufficient without it. And so that was one way of kind of engaging in that. But recognizing what we might have um, that would make others feel less comfortable um, and doing our best to avoid that. When I go to the synagogue, if I do have to give a prayer, for example, uh, certain terms might be omitted because they're perfectly fine for me to say as a Muslim, maybe perfectly fine as Christians, but, but uh, in the Jewish tradition, uh, they're not necessarily utilized. And so recognizing those, those and, and um, being respectful of that space and creating a safe environment. Um, there were, and this is what I was saying about the verses, you know, trying to see what we have in common. So one verse that stood out to me was, I think, in Proverbs, it says, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for the maker, but whoever is kind, the needy honors God. And in the Quran, it says, the righteous are those who feed the poor and the orphan and the captive for the love of God, saying, we feed you for the sake of God alone, and we seek from you uh, neither reward nor thanks. If we went through every single verse that we have in common, I'm sure we could all write a very nice book ourselves, right? There is actually a book, um, The Three Testaments, uh, and I apologize, I'm not sure who compiled it, but they, they went through that exercise of pulling all the verses from the three Abrahamic faiths that we have in common, and there's a workbook that goes along with it um, that you can do with your community or with you know, a smaller group if you want to to um, study those similarities a bit more um, together. Um, another topic that I think we wanted to touch on um, were the joys and the challenges of being, so I, I, I struggled with this one a little bit, and, I, and you, can, you can clarify it for me if you'd like, but the joys and the challenges of being, um, I guess, Muslim in the DC area. Um, Personally, with the political rhetoric as it is, it is a struggle for a lot more than Muslims. Um, but there is a heightened level, and, and I, I have to be honest, I, I, I struggled with the joy part because for me, I can't do DC. I can't do all of it. <laughs> Hence the moving westward to Winchester where I thought it would be calmer, but whatever. Um, so I had, to, I had to do a little bit of research from others to see what the joys would, uh, would be of being in the area. And as I was doing that exercise, just reflecting on the simple fact that when you are here um, in the space where all of this dialogue is taking place, where we are hearing what politicians are saying for better or for worse, it is certainly a place where people can be a part of making the change. They can be the game. They can be game changers within their smaller communities, or in the larger community, and that can be both negative or positive. Um, in the aftermath of 9/11, uh, there were numerous attempts to to scapegoat. Right, just find a community that we can say they did it, and that gets everybody off of our backs for a little bit. That was certainly heightened in the DC area. Um, we did see individuals um, having heightened. 
part of that was out of one individual who uh, made it her mission to make sure that she highlighted these groups of people. And her being a game changer in this, but she had that ability in a, in a space like we have here, where it's easy to access the politicians. It's, easy, it's easier to get these things done. Um, so that's part of the challenge that we face. And of course, something as simple as the media. When you're talking about local and national news, everything is heightened here because it's all local and it's all national, where, to be quite honest, if you go to a smaller town or you go out to Midwest, you're still hearing, hearing on the news about the fairs and the you know, spelling bees at the school. You're still getting something that's positive. And so when you hear about local, it's not, as, it's, it's not the entire focus. But in this area, it really is. And that is really challenging, especially for young people who are going to school, who then are dealing with the bullying and uh, you know, the name calling or even the physical aggression. Um, so there is, there is a challenge, um, and that has an impact on the children in particular, you know, psychologically even long term. Um, so we do have to deal with that. At the same time, uh, you do have the positive game changers. So you have an opportunity to be at the table. Uh, I have a good friend who has, she was working with the Obama administration for eight years. She started working with the Trump administration and then for other reasons she moved on to uh, another path. But she had the opportunity to be there as a Muslim woman in hijab and make uh, a voice and be at the table for the Muslims. So there's certainly a positive aspect as well. Um, the diversity, like. I said, I moved to Winchester, coming from an area like this and then planting yourself in Winchester, I was like, oh, I represent all the Muslims in the world. <laughs> um, and so that was you know, something that was new, whereas here it was easy to kind of, if I wanted to, there's plenty of others I could kind of run under the radar for a little bit, but that's, that's certainly since changed. And so enjoying the diversity here, um, and feeling safe within it because you usually can find a group or a community that's close, that can relate to you and you can fall back on. One of the challenges I actually did have when I got there was immediately, um, it was put into the paper that this United Methodist Church had hired a Muslim. It didn't go over well. Um, and, and so, you know, there had to be a lot of discussions of what next steps would be, keeping everybody, you know, safe and, and whatnot. Um, and here you can, and so at that time when I felt like, okay, I'm ready to take this step to another community and take on more of a leadership role, immediately as soon as all of that happened, I'm like, where's my community that I get to fall back onto just to kind of know that I'm safe? And I'm like, there is no community. Um, I have to work on building that. So, you know, here in a place where you have that diversity, you do have uh, a safe space, you have a place to fall back onto, but at the same time, you have so much opportunity to learn. Uh, about each other and about our, our um, different strengths that we bring to the table, whether it's through religion, whether it's through different nationalities and talents and skills. And so um, from my research of talking to others about the joys, because I was struggling, um, you know, that was certainly a highlight for them was just being in a diverse, uh, in a diverse place. And now having relocated, I also appreciate that diversity uh, myself. There was also, um, a lot more, one of the things that I was told as a comfort when I was, um, when it was expressed that there was not, not everybody was happy that I was at the United Methodist uh, University, one of the things that someone was told me, she told me was, it's okay. In Winchester, people have a lot to say, but they're actually really lazy. So I was safe in that way as well, whereas here, a challenge is that people aren't always lazy. They're, right, you know, they're go-getters, and so when they have something on their mind, good or bad, they might go to pursue that. And so that was something to think about um, as well. But I, I, I was challenged with this question a little bit because I wasn't sure of um, how it actually is really, really different for Muslims here in the Washington area. So I just want to make sure that whatever the intention of that question was, if I, if I answered it, if I did not, please let me know, and we can come back to it. You can switch this slide, I'm not 100% uh, sure which is the right one. Yeah, you can go forward once more. Okay, um, the, other th the other question that was raised was laws and rulings in Islam. So, 
Uh, I actually think it was particularly related to food and dress, but I have to go back a little bit just to kind of give you a picture of how law is, is, is done in Islam. Um, so there's not one specific like codified rules, uh, rule of Islamic law. So when we do hear people say, well, Islam says da da da, take it with a grain of salt because Islam actually has uh, various interpretations of things. The main, um, the main sect within Islam, and we'll get to that in a second, is the Sunni tradition. That's about 85 to 90 percent of the people. Within that tradition, you have four schools of thought. So all of these schools of thought are based off of a number of things. The first is that we have certain principles on which all law is based. And the first and most important of those is the protection of human life. Okay? So now whenever you're creating law, you have to, you have to consider these different um, principles, and it cannot contradict those. If somebody's life is on the line, it, you might have a different ruling than if everybody is safe, because the priority is make sure that you preserve life. Um, and another important piece to keep in mind is that the Quran has 6,000 plus verses. That is our main source of information about our religion. But we also have the Sunnah, which is the teachings of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And we basically take the sunnah as an exegesis of the Qur'an, right? So the Qur'an, in its 6,000 plus verses, has approximately 500 that pertain to law. The rest will be dealing with uh, what God's characteristics, there'll be stories so that we understand how to live out certain aspects of these things, but the, the details of how we pray, of how we pay our almsgiving, are given in the tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and that's where the details of that come out from. Um, so Islam itself is, when a, when a Muslim says they're Muslim and they're following Islam, that means they're submitting to the will of God. So what God decrees is what we follow. Um, now God has parameters for everything. So if we look at the example of the question being food, for example, there are, Muslims are allowed to eat. Alhamdulillah, that's good. Um, however, Muslims cannot consume alcohol. Muslims cannot consume pork, right? So there's parameters God has put. Now we often, as human beings, want to understand, well, why, why, why? Yes, there may be reasons, there's health reasons, we can debate that, whether it's good to have this or good to have that or whatever. Are there benefits in something that a, that a pig can offer? All of those things can be discussed and discussed. But when you as a Muslim are following God's command, when God says don't do it, you don't do it. It's not about the why. That's for him to know. Uh, God himself has 99 names, all of which he's put a tiny bit on earth uh, of those names and characteristics so that we might understand him. One of them is wisdom. And 